rejoice and be glad in it. Praise God. Welcome to Wednesday night recharge here at By God Inspired Fellowship in South Haven, Mississippi. Praise God for each and every one that is joining with us on today. The Lord is good and his mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth to all generations. So on tonight, we're just going to take some time to go before Lord, our Lord God in prayer. We're going to just petition him because he's a good God, no matter what's going on. Even as the lesson was on last Wednesday, your destiny is greater than your difficulties. So no matter what the difficulties are, no matter what you're facing, no matter what your children are doing, no matter what your spouse is doing, no matter what's happening well on your job or in government or wherever, anything that's going on, it's still, God is still able. Sickness in your body, he's Jehovah Rapha. He's able to heal you. So we just come to him on tonight in prayer, just knowing that he is a God who hears our every prayer. Hallelujah. Praise God. I just want to read a little bit of scripture out of Psalms 139. I love it. Psalms 139 and 7. It's a reassurance to me. It says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there, your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So Father God, we just thank you on today for your love and your grace. We thank you that you are a God who is everywhere, all at the same time. You're right here with us. You're right with them. Wherever we are, God, you are always there. You're already there. And you're a God who is in control. You're taking care of our situations right now, God. Father, you said that we could cast our cares upon you, that we could roll the cares of our hearts upon you, that we don't have to worry because you care for us. And so, God, we give you praise on tonight. We thank you that you're a God who loves us no matter what, who's right beside us, who's with us in every situation. So we give you praise and we magnify your name. You are Jehovah Jireh, you are the provider for us, God. There is nothing that we need that you cannot provide. You are El Shaddai, the many-breasted one. You supply, you sustain us. Hallelujah. We bless your name. Thank you, Father, that you are Jehovah Shalom. You are the God of peace. You are the God who gives us the peace that passes all of our understanding, that keeps our minds and our hearts in Christ Jesus. Oh God, we thank you on today. We thank you, Father, for this day. We thank you, God, for how you protected us and how you've kept us safe, God, from danger, seen, those things that we may have known about, but you've kept us from unseen dangers, God. And we thank you for it on today. We bless your name, oh God, for all that you do. Father, we thank you that you are sovereign and that you are seated on your throne, that you're at rest, oh God, that you know all about everything that is going on. And so, Father, we lift up those that have asked for prayer on today. We lift up uh, uh, the Jordans, God. We lift up Victoria and Tamara, the baby, God. We just lift them up before you right now, God, that you're a healer and you're a consoler. You are the paraclete. You are our comforter and our keeper. And so we bless you on today, God. Oh God, for those that are praying for healing in their bodies, oh God, for I, I, I lay my grandbaby on the altar on today, God. Hallelujah. Father, we've gotten a, a report we don't like, but God, you're able to do exceeding abundantly more than we can ask or think. And so I lay Kimora at the altar on today, God. Father, we just praise your name and we thank you for everything that you do. 
We give you glory, Father. We magnify your name for you are holy and you are righteous. You are worthy of all of our praise. We thank you that you are a God who's never lost a battle. You are a God who is always sovereign. You are victorious, victorious, and you have called us to be more than conquerors on today, God. So we stand in victory ourselves, God. Even those that are bereaved with their heads down, Father, even the student who uh, committed suicide, oh God. We got that report, Father, but God, you are still able you're able to do more than we can ask or think. And so, God, we come and we just lay everything at the altar. We're not going to pick it up, but we're going to leave it in your hands because we trust you. We trust you with our lives. We trust you. We trust you with our lives. You're a God who is worthy of our trust. Hallelujah. And so we bless you on today. We give you all the glory, God. We magnify you, Father. We just lift up holy hands unto you, God, without wrath, God. We say thank you, Father, for all that you have done. We say thank you, God, for blessing us on today. Thank you, Father, for smiling upon us today. Thank you, God, for your mercy and your sovereignty on today. Thank you, Father, that you are God. You are God. You are sovereign. You are El Elyon, you are God, hallelujah, and we bless your name. We can't thank you enough, God. In this season, in this month where everyone is talking about Thanksgiving, Father, we have reason to thank you no matter what things look like. We can still say thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for all you've done. We thank you, God, and we bless your name on tonight. We give you all the glory, all the honor and all the praise in Jesus mighty name we do pray with thanksgiving in our hearts praise God hallelujah so our teacher for tonight is here praise God he's going to be coming forth with the lesson for us but I want you just to stay in an attitude of gratefulness and praise and worship before the Lord on tonight for the Lord is good and his mercy is everlasting his truth endured to all generations. And so now you're going to be in the hands of uh, Pastor Artist Taylor, who's going to take us higher in the Lord on tonight. Praise the name of the Lord. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor Cheryl. At one point, I didn't think I was going to make it. But God so fit to allow me to make it out to the house of prayer, out to Bible class. Bible study to me is one of the most important parts of all of church. It's great to be on Sundays when we worship God and when we, when we get sermons, but when we really want to dig into the word, it's at Bible study. Amen. Amen. Tonight, I want to talk to you guys about a few things. So I'll be coming from multiple places. So 1 Kings chapter 2 verses 2 and 3, 1 Kings chapter 3 verses 5 through 9, 1 Kings chapter 11 verses 3 and 4, and Ecclesiastes 12 verses 13 and 14. I will go back through that. Amen. I'll go back through that. And we'll read those verses and start off. So I'll, I'll go back through that. Again, uh, the first passage is 1 Kings chapter 2, verses uh, 2 and, and 3. So 1 Kings 2, 2 and 3. Amen. And I'll be reading from the New International Version. It says, it says, I'm about to go the way of all the earth, he said. So be strong, act like a man, and observe what the Lord your God requires. Walk in obedience to him and keep his decrees and commands, his laws and regulations as written in the law of Moses. I went on to three, I apologize. He said, do this so that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you go. This is David talking to Solomon. And indeed, it is good advice. First Kings chapter three, verses five through nine. If my... 
book will act right with me, verses 5 through 9. Solomon answered, you have shown great kindness to your servant, my father David, because he was faithful to you and righteous and upright in heart. You have continued this great kindness to him and has given me, given him a son who to sit on his throne this very day. Now, Lord, my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David, but I am only a child and do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to count or number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? Powerful, powerful mess, passages of well. Just a little thing about those. What What's really going on at this time is Solomon is getting ready to take over for David, and David has given Solomon his blessing, but Solomon said, I am not what I should be. I, I'm still a child, and I need to know how to govern your people. We'll jump to 1 Kings chapter 11, verses 3 and 4, and I promise y'all, I promise y'all, we're going to come back to all of this, but just going to do a different type. Wanted to read through, and then we'll come back and do a little bit of discussion. Is that all right? Amen. First Kings chapter 11, verses 3 and 4. And it talks about Solomon. He said, he has 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines, and his wives led him astray. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God as the heart of, his, uh, heart of David his father had been. Man, they... Solomon is falling down that trap. Y'all know how sometimes people will fall down the trap. Then the last scripture that we'll read for tonight, and we'll come back through and discuss it all. Uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 13 and 14. This is the end of Ecclesiastes, and Solomon is a person we believe who have written Ecclesiastes. And what he says is, now all has been heard. Here is the, the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. Solomon has jumped all the way back to where he was with God. What I want to talk about tonight is the danger of forgetting who you are. The danger of forgetting who you are. There's a great gospel singer that I like. His name is John P. Key. And John P. Key has sang so many big songs, and he's really sang a lot of songs and written a lot of songs that a lot of choirs sing today. But John P. Key was born in Durham, North Carolina. He always says affectionately outside of the county line. He's, he's always talking about talking about he even says it in his songs he said that's, that's how we do it in Durham in Durham North Carolina right outside the county line and he's always talking about his grandfather and his grandmother and how they had such a great impact on his life music was a part of his upbringing and every week he was always attending church and he even started his own choir when he was 13 years old so he was an incredible musical talent but then something happened. John P. Key went from the church to the streets. Well before he became this top gospel artist that sold millions of records, he said he went into the streets of Charlotte and started selling drugs. He always talks about at times he was able to make $30,000 a month. And it all changed one night when him and one of his boys, his, his good friend, the one that really got him out there into doing all of this wrong stuff. Now, here he had this boy who started in the church, formed a choir by the time he was 13, singing and appeared to be on fire for God. Then all of a sudden, he switched and went into the streets and tried to do things that everybody else was doing. And what happened was, his good friend died in a cocaine deal gone bad. And what he said was, that night, 
God delivered him. And what he prayed was a prayer to God that said, Lord, if you could get me out of this. Y'all know how we pray that prayer. Lord, if you get me out of this, I won't be back in this situation again. Well, lo and behold, he paid, prayed that prayer, and he never made it back to that place. He turned his life around, and, and he started to serve God at this church called New Life Fellowship Church. And from there, he started the New Life Community Choir and that's where he, that's where we know him from. And this is his story. This is something that he shared in an interview. And it really got me to thinking about this, about all these passages when you look at Solomon. Solomon was a person that was just like that. His dad had raised him right. He had always seen the right thing to do. But towards the end of his life, he switched and went completely away. So Solomon started out well in his life. He listened to his father. He trusted God. He walked with God. And the Bible says that God prospered Solomon. I mean, Solomon's early humility is shown in 1 Kings 3, verses 5 through, 5 through 9. And that's when we saw that Solomon asked God for wisdom. He said, help me to have that discerning heart, be to have a discerning spirit. So Solomon understood that I'm not, the, I'm not where I need to be. So he asked God for wisdom to judge his people, to govern his people. And that's something I think a lot of us should, should get in the habit of doing. Ask God for what we need. We have to start asking God for the wisdom that we need in our day-to-day -day decisions. I had to look at myself over this past couple of weeks. I can't tell you how many times I asked God for direction or asked him for, to help me with a decision because I didn't do it. We ought to be in the habit of doing what Solomon did and asking God to guide us in every single decision we make. And I know that sometimes people say, well, you know what? God gives us five senses. He does. God helps us. God puts us in a place where we can make decisions ourselves. Yes, he does. But my prayer started to be earlier this week just on yesterday. That's why I say earlier this week. It was yesterday. But yesterday my prayer changed to God, help me make the right decisions. Because see, I have, I have people reporting to me, and I need to make the right decisions for them. I need to be the right place for them. I need to take up for them when I need to. I need to fight the battles for them that I need to fight for them. But most of all, I need to say the right things at the right times. So that became my prayer. Lord, help me to say the right things, to do the right things. And I actually say, Lord, speak for me. Because when I say it, it doesn't always come out right. So we have King Solomon. He, it, the, Bible, the Bible shows that, that Solomon, by all accounts, had this practical wisdom. And he knew how to follow God. He was also the one who wrote the Song of Solomon. How many know about the Song of Solomon? I tell everybody, the Song of Solomon is the is the best. Uh, uh, it's better than any any soap opera you can you can watch. It, it's it's so much deepness in that, and a lot of times people try to say that really that's he's trying to explain God's love for the church. No, he's not. God, Solomon explaining how how a, a loving relationship between a husband and wife should be. So Solomon Solomon knew what was right, but he did wrong anyway. He forgot who he was. In Deuteronomy chapter 17, verses 14 through 20, God gave clear instructions for anyone who would be king. He says, don't amass too many horses. Don't, don't have too many wives. Don't accumulate so much gold, silver and gold. Because what God is saying is this is where you will start to put your focus on. What, what I learned is, is by watching Solomon is you can't have too much of anything because then your attention will be divided. The more you divide your attention, the less you can pay attention to God. Now, in, in the job that I'm currently in, it really became relevant to me because I have so many people that report to me. At one point, I, have, I had 54 people individual contributors reporting to me and I had to be involved in each one of their projects. So when you look at that, people 
people was wondering, how, why is it that you only get about four hours of sleep a night? Well, my people work all over the globe, so I'm, I'm up at all hours of the night just to be on projects with them and talking to their customers to make sure everything goes right. But all of my time was divided, and I didn't have time for God. And I'm going to be real with you. When you don't have time for God, your life starts to show it. You start to say things out of character. You start to do things out of character. And then you start to look in the mirror and say, hold on, who is this dude? Who is this guy? I don't talk like this. I don't say stuff like this. What am I doing? It was because my time with God had been so divided that I was reverting back to a person that I didn't want to be. So God gave these commands because they're designed to prevent the king from trusting in his own might, from trusting in his own money, from trusting in anything that he had. Same rules applies to us, and these rules are in place so we don't get beside ourselves. Because having a team that large, largest team in the area, yeah, my head did get big, and it's already big. I mean, it's already big, but it got bigger because I thought I was something to have this many people reporting to me. Little did I know it would take so much of my time. Where was God? Where in the world was God? So when we look at what Solomon had, Solomon, the Bible tells us that he was the richest king that, 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 that ever lived, right? Tells us about all these concubines and wives that he had. I, I think one count is well over 700. So the question, the first question I was asking is, so what, what do you think caused Solomon to stray away from God? A lot of times people will always go to his number of wives. Yep, they did do it, but they weren't the only thing. Solomon was richer than everyone else. Sometimes money can be that thing that pulls you away. You can think that the job you have or the amount of money that you have in your savings or even, even the stuff that you have in investments, if all of that starts to matter more than God, you tend to lose who you are. One thing I notice about what God does with, with people that, that calls themselves his children is God will start to remove things from your life so you can focus on him. And I've seen it happen. I've gone from 54, I'm down to 49, and before... This month is out, I'll be down to 20. And before next month is out, I'll be down to none. <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's funny to me because what God has already shown me is, unless you spend time with me, nothing else is going to prosper. Now, there are people that's prospering by doing wrong, but hey, we're not worried about what they do because what we're concerned about is where our true citizenship is, which is not on this earth, which is not in this city, this state, this country, but our true citizenship is in heaven. So we have to start living our lives as if we were living in heaven. So the next question I have is, so what's the danger of forgetting who you are? What's the danger? The danger of forgetting who you are is ending up in a place that you don't want to be, being a person that you don't want to be. In the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon starts, he, when he starts off the book, he says, everything is worthless. It's basically what he's saying. He said, everything is useless. There's nothing under the sun that is new, and that's true. There's nothing that's worth it at all, and he spent his whole time talking about the issues that he's been through to get to the end of the book to say, I should have focused on God all the time. Ecclesiastes, uh, well, what uh, uh, I've already talked about, the parallels. Uh, I, well, I didn't, I, I kind of alluded to it, but the parallels in Solomon's story and John P. Key's story. They both started with the Lord. They both fell off from the Lord. And at the end, they both came back 
to the Lord. So those are the, the parallels. And I would venture to say that we as children of God, we will see those same parallels from time to time. Now, will we fall off as much as Solomon did? Maybe not. Will we fall off as much as John P. Key did? Maybe not. But we can still see the same parallels because when I fell off, I didn't fall off like them. But then I started to talk out of character and act out of character. Shoot, I was fussing in, in meetings, and I, I'm not the guy that fusses. I'm the guy that build bridges. I'm the, I'm the encourager, and I found myself not encouraging anyone. And I know that that's one of the gifts that God gave me. So if God has called me to be an encourager, how in the world do I get to a point where I'm not encouraging anyone? Not spending time with him, taking my focus off him. So Ecclesiastes, they give us the rest of Solomon's story. He, he writes in Ecclesiastes, I, I've done everything under the sun to find fulfillment apart from God. That's, that's the basic gist of that whole book is Solomon said, I've tried everything. He said, I tried partying. That didn't do it. I tried eating as much as I wanted to eat. That didn't do it. I tried to have as many women as I wanted to have. That didn't do it. I tried to look at all the money. I had more money than I knew what to do with. That didn't do it. In other words, nothing will satisfy you until you have God. Nothing will satisfy you. In Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 8, Solomon said, I have, I have massed silver and gold and, tre and the treasure of kings and provinces. I acquired a harem, the delights of a man's heart. But verse 11 says, everything was meaningless, a chasing after the wind. And in the end, he tells us, here's the conclusion. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. The whole duty that we have is to be God's representatives in this earth. If we're trying to do anything outside of being God's representatives, we are wrong. If I could say this, say it like this, we need to have an evangelistic lifestyle. Now, that's not saying that every time I see somebody, hey, are you saved? It's saying that I'm living a life that is causing people to ask, what must I do to be saved? I'm living a life of character, one that God can be proud of. I'm living a life of commitment, the type of commitment that God has, which is a covenant commitment. And, and really what that means is, I'm going to do my part whether you say you're going to do yours or not. And then living a life of compassion. These are the things I call the three C's of life. Character, commitment, and compassion. Because this is what God shows to us. We see his character and how he treats us, even though we don't deserve to be treated as well as we do, as well as we are. We see his commitment because time and time again, he makes us successful, he keeps us living. And even the folks that are struggling, because you are still alive, God has given another day to get right with him. It doesn't matter whether we have or whether we have not. We got to be like Paul, learn to be content in all things. Paul said, I've, been, I've had plenty and I've been where I didn't have anything. And I learned to be content in every situation. And that's what we have to, we have to get that, then that compassion. Paul's always telling us, don't think more highly of yourself than what you ought to. Think about other folks, and it says in the word, ahead of yourself, and what he's really saying is, don't be so conceited that you think you're better than everybody else. And don't get to the point where you're not concerned about somebody else's well-being because you're only concerned about you. Now, that's something that I see happen a lot. People are more concerned about themselves than they are for you. You know, the ones that, that, ones, uh, that you're always a great friend for them, but they never make it to be a great friend for you. You're, you're the person that, always, uh, that they always call when they need something, but if you call them, they either don't answer, or when they answer, you know what, man, I, I, hey, look, it's, it's hard over here. I, I can't help you. So, so, but the word tells us that we need to be compassionate to this point 
where we care about other folks. And the reason is we don't live this life in, in, in silos. We don't live this life solitarily. We live this life because, uh, with, with other people. When you look at the relationship of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they're in perfect communion. We ought to be in perfect communion with each other. What separates the body of Christ is some of us think we have better blessings than others. Some of us think that our gifts is what makes us better than others. Some of us think that all of the gifts we have to have in order to be saved. But the word just don't, just don't match with that. Because Paul said he gave some apostles, some pastors, some teachers. We go further, some encourages, some in organization, some just to be, just to stand there and be committed. God has put everything that a church needs to succeed inside of that church. Every single thing that's needed. It all comes back to me, it all comes back to these three C's. Character, commitment, and compassion. When we forget who we are, our character starts to drop off. When we forget who we are, our commitment, it doesn't seem, it's not important to us. Y'all know how sometimes folks will make promises that they have no intentions on keeping. You're losing that commitment. And then that compassion, when you could see a person in need and walk by them. That's what always struck me with the story of the Good Samaritan. Jesus was talking to Jews, to the Jewish leaders, and he was telling them about this story. He said, consider this man. He was a Jewish man, and he, felt, he got jumped by some robbers. They robbed him. They beat him, left him for dead, and it says that a priest came through, saw him, ah, stepped to the other side of the street. Said another teacher of the law came through, saw him, and went around him. Then here was this Samaritan, the, per, the people that the Jews did not like. He came up on the man, saw him, had compassion on him. Picked him up, nursed his wounds, took him to an inn, and had the man, had the keeper of the inn take care of him. Here's money for him, and if he owes anything else, I'll come back and pay that. And Jesus said, who was the better friend? And they said, the one that had compassion on him. Now, what struck me in that was that was still, it, it, he was dealing with people's hearts, and even in that situation, their hearts still weren't quite right, and I'll tell you why. It was, they weren't quite right because they didn't say the Samaritan. They said the person that had compassion still didn't want to get, call out who it was. Said that to say this, we have to be compassionate people because that's who God has called us to be. Amen. If you don't believe that, check out our First Peter chapter three, verses eight and nine. You can read that when you get home. Those are my, those were the verses that came to me when I started that. But I got do have some lessons that we can learn from Solomon's life. First lesson that we can learn from Solomon's life is: be careful of the influences you allow into your life. Be careful of the influences that you allow into your life. We saw the story with John P. Key. He let the wrong friends influence him to go do the wrong things. And in doing that, he, saw, he ended up seeing somebody die in front of him, and that changed his life forever. I don't ever want to be in that situation. Not ever. But when you look at Solomon, Solomon had the wrong influence as well. He had too many wives. He had too much stuff. Stuff can be as big of a distraction as anything else. Be careful of the influences you allow into your life. Number two, it doesn't pay to, to disobey the word of God. It doesn't pay to disobey the word of God. I think that's as simple as it, as, as it is. It doesn't pay to disobey the word of God. It comes to a point where God tells Solomon, if it had not been for his servant, David, he would have done away with it. So it doesn't pay for us to disobey the word of God. 
because the thing that people tend to forget is sin has its own consequences. Sin has its own consequences. And I say that because when you look at Leviticus chapter 5, verses 16 and 17, God says, woe unto the people that commit sins uh, or that commit so many sins, he said, because they will be held accountable. He said they will be punished because of the sin. Sin has its own consequences, so it doesn't pay to disobey the word of God. The next thing that we learn is short-term pleasure is not worth the long-term separation from God. So short-term pleasure is not worth the price of long-term separation from God. A lot of us have a problem where we think in the here and now. We never think down the road. We think about what I can do right now. When you look at when you look at we look at people e even in 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 this area, you you see what what Pastor V calls consumers. And you have owners, they're, they're different. Because the consumers are always out to get what I can get right here, right now, as soon as possible. The owners understand that, you know what, it may take a while. Likewise, short-term pleasure is not worth the long-term price of separation from God. Being satisfied right now could hurt your long-term standing with the Lord. It, 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 it doesn't matter what that satisfaction is. You know, I, I, I grew up in, this, in, in a place in South Mississippi where, you know, the people love to get you back if you did something or if you said something. So, so we, we did a lot of talking about each other. We called it jaw janking. You know, we were just really going at it. And the older I got, the more I realized that all of that negative talk was having a negative impact on me. So I quit doing it. Consequently, my family members started to slow down. They still, they don't, they didn't stop, but they don't do it around me, which is all, you know, that's most important to me. It got to the point that the pleasure of getting you back mattered more than you being happy. The pleasure of getting somebody back will separate you from God. I was just letting that sink in because that's, to me, is powerful. Because when you look at short-term pleasure, and then you look at the price of separation from God, it's not a situation that I ever want to be in again. Amen. Had to say it like that. Just want to be real. Amen. Amen. Last thing I want to tell y'all that we learned from Solomon's life is just because God allows you to make your own decisions does not mean he wants us to do it towards sin. Just because God allows us to make our own decisions doesn't mean God wants us to make a decision that will lead us into sin. God allows us to make our own decisions for a reason because he wants us to choose his way. To choose him. The, the greatest example of love is not forcing a person to be obedient to you. The greatest example of love is to show that person how you love them and then let them choose to do you the same way. That's the greatest example of love and that's, that's what God did. God showed his love for us in this that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us. That greatest example of love. And that's from Romans chapter 5, I believe, verse 8. It says, God committed his love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That verse is powerful because it says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died. While we were in the past yet sinners, here we are, Christ died for us. It's, it's, and that just shows that his sacrifice is still atoning for our sins to this day. Just because we have the ability to make decisions does not mean we should make decisions just for us. If I could say it like this, we need to start thinking about how what we do impact other people. 
one of the biggest problems in relationships, where there's friendship, where there is a uh, significant other, where it's, whether it's husband and wife, is where one only makes decisions based on them and them only. It causes problems because I'm so selfish. I'm only thinking about me to begin with. But if I made decisions based on how would this impact someone else? Again, that's that compassion thing. How would this impact someone else? Just because God allows us to do it doesn't mean we should make decisions solely based for us. Amen, amen. Amen. That is really all I have for y'all tonight. Any, any questions? Any questions? I love questions. I love questions. Comments? I love them too. Okay. Amen. Amen. about the uh, the parable that Jesus was t teaching about the uh, the uh, good Samaritan yeah uh, and you talked about compassion and uh, I believe the second guy had compassion and the reason why I say that is because he went over to the man and looked at him. Now, having read the Old Testament, I think both men were concerned about becoming unclean and they couldn't serve. Because you're going to be, un if you come near a dead body, you'll be unclean seven days or something. You couldn't, you couldn't serve as priest. Amen. But, and so they were guarding their religious duty. They had a religious duty to serve in the temple or whatever. But the third guy did not have any religious obligations. Mm -hmm. And so he was free to show compassion to the man. And he did so. So by me having read Old Testament and Jesus told that parable, I kind of understood why they did what they did. Mm -hmm. I think they were concerned, but they were more concerned about the religious duty of serving as priest. Yep. And, and, and in those instances... What Jesus tells us is don't be concerned, so concerned with that religious duty that you forget your original duty to the Lord to care about others. It's, a, it's the same way, it's the same way he told, he was telling, he was telling uh, the, the uh, Pharisees who, who were said, who told the folks, he said they put so many rules on these folks and they weren't doing it themselves. He said you burdened them, he said, but you've forgotten what you're supposed to be doing. The religious service, if I could say it like Martin Luther King Jr., religiosity is the problem <laughs> because they were more concerned with their religion than where they were with a person that God has created. Yeah, I like that. I like that. Dr. Amen. King is. I like that. He coined that. Uh, he coined that. That word. Uh, he didn't. I don't know if he coined it. I don't okay. know if he coined it. I really I, don't. I, I really. I think it existed before, but he knew how to use it. <laughs> he meant. <laughs> now, content. I mean, uh, being content mm -hmm. and being complacent. Woo. Now, you talk about. That's different. Hey, Amen. What, what I mean, give me. All right. How how you know you're being content and not being complacent? Because I think I'm content. I'm content in a particular place, but somebody else sees it as being complacent. No, it, it, the difference, the biggest difference is this. Complacency is I'm not trying to do anything. I'm not trying to get any better. I, I'm not trying to help anyone. I'm complacent where I am. Being content doesn't mean I'm not doing anything, doesn't mean I'm not working, doesn't mean I'm not happy. Being content just says, hey, Look, whatever comes my way, I'm going to be content in this place. I'm going to keep on making it. Complacency is that, is that when folks get to that point, uh, for, for instance, the, the people that, that, that don't have jobs, but they're praying to God to give them a job, and they're not checking any job boards, they're not doing anything, they're sitting, on a house, they're sitting at the house waiting on the phone to ring, and they don't even know you're looking. So those folks are complacent because they're just sitting there. 
So it's yeah, it's definitely different between contentment and being complacent. So you being content, if someone sees it as complacency, whoo, they, they, they're missing it. <laughs> Any other questions? Any other questions? Lady Rhonda? I, th- I saw you pull your mask down, you know. thought she was getting ready to drop one of those nuggets of wisdom on us. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Don't pull your mask down. Don't put you on the spot, Pastor Earl. Just, just to put a <laughs> Any other questions? Any other questions? Amen again. Go ahead. Go ahead. This mic. Um, I just wanted to kind of comment on what the brother was sharing. Uh, you really already uh, uh, dealt with it, but what came to mind when uh, he was saying that was when, uh, you know, they rebuked Jesus for healing on the Sabbath day. Mm. And he told them, you know, if you had an ox or an animal that fell down in a ditch on the Sabbath day, wouldn't you get them out? Yeah. You know, and to show them that they were showing, you know, they were double-minded. They were doing those things that, uh, you know, puffed them up or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, yes, your point was a good point, but as uh, Pastor Taylor is saying, our initial obligation is to people, to love people, to mm-hmm. love God by loving people. And so we have to get our priorities straight. That's why Jesus came, you know, because we, we nobody can live by the law. Amen. We all were doomed. No one can keep the law, and the law is such that if you break one law, you've you broken them all. all. You know, so that's why Jesus came. That's why we uh, walk in the grace and the liberty that we have in Christ, but excellent point. Amen. Amen. It was. It was. Amen. What makes you think that the Jews at that time were so dogmatic about the law? They had the scriptures. Mm -hmm. They had the Old Testament. They had the law. They had the prophets. But they still didn't believe who Jesus was. Mm-hmm. That has always confounded me. Power and prestige. Power, prestige, and I'll go further in pride. Power because they held the power over the Jewish people and then prestige because the Romans knew that the Jewish leaders held the power over the Jewish people so they treated them a special kind of way. So these folks, they felt entitled to be in this place and they didn't want to see anyone interrupt what they had. Pride because they got to that point where I won't allow myself to believe that he is the Messiah. What 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 did what did what did uh, Nicodemus I believe it was it said he said um, he said that we know you are sent from God. We see the work that you are doing. So they saw it. But some of them pride wouldn't let them accept who he was. So power, prestige, and pride mess many people up. Do you think it's like that today and it can be like that prior to the Lord coming? I think it'll be like that till the Lord come back. The religious? The I honestly believe it. I, I mean, I, I mean, we can, we can look at it in terms of government. We can look at it in terms of churches. It, it, it doesn't matter. You can see it across the United States. And then you find, you find, uh, you find some churches that's really just trying to be on fire for God. And, and, and we can't, we can't pay to get a hundred members, a hundred people to show up on Sunday. <laughs> but the, but folks that, that that hold on to their power, to that hold on to that prestige, you know, like some people, they like having an entourage around them, and and like having, and, and there's nothing against having protection around you, but, but but some folks like that entourage around them, and they don't go anywhere without their whole entourage, and yet you supposed to be serving the Lord. You cannot serve the Lord 
with all the entourage around you because what, what are you really living? What's your life really showing? So we see it. In the government, they, they constantly make laws that benefit people that's, more, that's, that's well off and the people that are not going to get the short end of the stick every time. And then those of us in the middle going to pay for it all. That's what we do. So yes, I think that we will see people suffering, and I call it suffering, even though it looks like they're succeeding, but they're suffering from power, prestige, and pride. And I think we'll see it until Jesus comes back. Amen. I love this. I'm telling y'all, this is what really excites me. <laughs> Amen. No other questions? No other questions? Amen. I want to thank my brother for coming and giving me some questions. Made me happy all tonight. <laughs> you have made my night. Amen. 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 For those that join online, we truly appreciate you and thank you for joining us. And again, if you have questions, you can reach out to us and we don't mind answering those questions. Because the one thing that we are certain of, God didn't just put us here just to talk about the lofty spiritual idea. But he also put us here to reach you in the practical living that you go through right now. So please, ma'am, please, sir, share this video with it with everyone you think may need it. Share it with people you don't think need it, because I think that those are the people who need it the most. <laughs> Take this message with you. Don't forget who you are. Never forget who you are. And always remember those three C's, character, commitment, and compassion. If we live out those three things, we do, we live out what Jesus said. What did Jesus say? Oh, the greatest two commandments, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your spirit. And the second one, love your neighbor as yourself. He said all of the rest of the laws, hang on those two. And when I really started to think about it, if I love God and I love others, then I treat people right. I talk to people right. I'll act right and I'll do right. Amen. Let us pray and we'll go down from this place. Most gracious Father, we come to you just to say thank you. God, we thank you for just being the deliverer that you are. God, we thank you for delivering Pastor John P. King. But God, we thank you for delivering us. For Lord, we didn't always do the right thing. And God, we are prone to even slip at times now. But we are grateful that you are the forgiving God, that you can make us right with you. So God, we ask right now that you rest your spirit on each one of us. That for the rest of this week, that we say the words you want us to say. That we do the things that you want us to do. That we act how you want us to act. That we make the decisions that you want us to make. Be it so. Now Lord, keep us. Those of us gathered in the church tonight and those that are watching online, protect us as we travel to our homes. Protect the folks that are at home. God, we are ever so careful to give you the praise and the glory for the victory is already yours. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining BGI on tonight.